initial motivation for pursuing and expanding my research out from Lucknow was that there were African American musicians performing in these cities and that's largely what struck my interest. The main performer who received most of the attention was Teddy Weatherford who was originally from Chicago and in fact he was part of the sort of the Chicago jazz scene of the um, 1920s. He was heavily involved in creating and organizing uh, orchestras throughout India, including orchestras um, composed of both African American musicians, other foreign musicians, Christian Goa musicians, Anglo Indian musicians, Parsi musicians, and other Indian in musicians as well too. And he passed away of cholera in Calcutta in 1945. My approach to understanding this sort of jazz scene took on a number of different layers, one of which was to look through a lot of the old newspapers. Uh, and this is an example of um, an advertisement put out by Columbia Records and Teddy Weatherford's band is listed as one of the new gramophone um, discs for sale in India and as well as the Taj Mahal Hotel Dance Orchestra. The Taj Mahal Hotel, Mahal Hotel is a hotel in Bombay. Um, Ambrose and his orchestra was a local orchestra as well too. And these orchestras were, organ um, were advertised um, along um, other more prominent sort of global musicians such as Vera Lynn and Carmen Miranda recordings as well too. I found that there were a number of other African American musicians that were performing in um, jazz groups. Roy Butler was one who was also out of sort of the Chicago scene from Indiana originally. Um, Creighton Thompson. Uh, Cricket Smith. Uh, these are all African American musicians that were fairly uh, highly regarded in the United States before they came to India. So initially in, the in 1934 they were playing a lot of cutting-edge jazz tunes uh, straight from basically the United States. They split up sometimes. Roy Butler, for example, started his own orchestras at various times. Um, Creighton, Ta Creighton uh, Cricket Smith, excuse me, did as well too at various times, so, and achieved a high level, uh, a high status. And a lot of local musicians chose to uh, highly idealize these African American musicians as the sort of cutting edge jazz musicians that they chose to sort of follow. And the fact that these African American musicians, these black musicians, were able to achieve so much success was a source of inspiration for local musicians as well too. Um, a lot of the mu local musicians be able to, were able to say to themselves, you know, hey, you know, if, if these musicians can do it, then I can do it too. And that helped increase the popularity of jazz, especially in urban centers. I mean, all of this sort of helped create a sensibility, more of a cosmopolitan sensibility, especially among folks that were living in interior cities. Um, then later on, towards the late 1930s into World War II, you had huge numbers of other musicians performing jazz groups um, such as uh, Chick Chocolate um, and um, who was a very popular musician. Uh, Mickey Correa in the late 1930s moved from Karachi to Bombay to perform in groups and he went on to be a very well-renowned jazz musician um, and is in fact still uh, living uh, just adjacent to the Taj Mahal Hotel in Mumbai. There were a lot of expatriates here. A lot of soldiers, ex army men, air force men, navy men. World War II was considered uh, a, a time where there was a lot of vibrancy in terms of jazz connoisseurship. And the Canadians used to bring their own piano and have this their shows here. Used to play all the jazz and dance the all the old songs. As youngsters, we used to meet a lot of the armed forces because they were stationed here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the American soldiers had something that they called a V-disc. What's a V-disc? Uh, it was a 78 RPM. It was a 12-inch disc, flexible enough, not very good quality. It was supposed to be played maybe 20 times, 30 times. And then it, even if it was tossed away, it didn't matter. But great uh, recording companies, terrific jazz players all, did this free for their 
American Armed Forces. Performances by these African American musicians were relayed live uh, throughout North India. Um, I interviewed a number of elderly Anglo-Indian and Goan uh, musicians in Lucknow uh, who were still alive and that were around, in the, in, especially during World War II. I was hooked on to uh, listening to Radio Siak on radio. You probably don't know what Radio Siak is, and most people won't. It was Southeast Asia Command. It was the radio station set up by the Allied forces in Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka, and they played music for the armed forces, wherever they were in Asia. Twice a week they had real jazz programs. and. Uh, I got stuck, <laughs> it caught me and I started listening to it every week, twice a day, twice a week, every week. There was even a program especially for African American soldiers called Jubilee, which uh, featured, needless to say, featured black jazz musicians and uh, was hosted by a guy named Ernie Bubbles Whitman, who had a very jolly personality. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, for instance, uh, when, when Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker were in California for the first time in early 1945, they recorded for Jubilee. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of good stuff coming and jazz musicians performing. A lot of the African-American musicians were still living in uh, these cities and performing at this time. Uh, the African-American musicians started to become a bit marginalized uh, towards World War II as sort of antiquated uh, because they were not keeping up with a lot of the cutting edge styles that other people were listening to, but were still regarded um, as sort of uh, originary musicians that were involved in much of the original development of jazz, which was still closely related to and linked to the United States um, at that time. 